So uh, January 7th, uh, I woke up to go play flag football. Um, it was the first time I played since I was down here, so I was super excited. So my son and I, we got up and we headed out. Um, we were playing. Um, about an hour and a half in, I started to feel nauseous, get a little bit of tightness in my chest. Uh, I just pushed it off as just being exhausted. Um, so I went back out on the field for another 40 or so minutes. Um, by that time, the tightness in my chest had gotten worse. So we had, uh, we'd left, um, we drove home, and I told Sam that she should call her parents so we could go to the hospital. Um, within like five minutes, the, the pain in my chest was so intense that I just I left myself. So I left and found the closest stand-up ER to me, um, which was Bayfront, and I went there um, really cold, sweaty, chest pain, nauseous. Um, within 15 or so minutes, I was told I was having a heart attack. And shortly after that, I coded for the first time. I get a call from the ER doctor and said, uh, Mrs. Gale, your husband is having a heart attack. I need you to get here. Um, and the last time that I heard Alex's voice was when he was in the background saying, um, just please tell her everything's going to be OK. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and between that phone call and about 30 minutes or less, we pull up to the hospital, or I pull up to the hospital, um, and I'm thinking that we are just going to get my van and go to the other hospital where he's going to be transferred. Um, and the security officer actually runs out to my van and says, ma'am, ma'am, we need you to come inside. And I'm like, is everything okay? And he was like, oh yeah, everything's fine. Just, I need you to come inside for a second. I look over and see that it's playoff football time and the Dallas Cowboys, my favorite football team, are losing to the Green Bay Packers. So I'm like, this is, something's wrong because that does, that should not happen. Um, and then the doctor comes out and he sits down and he looks up at me um, and he says that whenever they're moving him over to the stretcher to go into the ambulance that he coded. Um, and then after that, he coded five more times, five more times. Um, and they were getting ready to transport him over to the other hospital. And I said, well, I, I want to see him. And he said, Miss Gale, I don't think that's a good idea. And I said, I need to see him before he goes to the other hospital. I thank God every day that my dad and I were the only people that had to see him. Pretty much lifeless on the on the cot, on the stretcher. Um, and the only thing that I could say was thank you to all the nurses and doctor because there, I mean, there was blood on the floor, there were towels. It was like a very bad, it was tragic. It was a mess, but I could tell that they had worked so hard to get him to the point where he was at. Um, but yeah, and then, so I kissed his forehead because that was the only part of his body that I could get to at that time. And then we got in the car and drove to the um, Bayfront Hospital downtown. There were, there wasn't like a, a typical day. I think the most consistent thing that happened during the day was that I had to get on the schedule with the doctors because there were 10 of them that would come by. So I needed to be awake first thing in the morning when certain, when the doctor started coming in and staying awake all day long when they would come by. Um, but there was nothing typical. It was, it seemed like all bad things kept happening. Um, okay, well now his body temperature is going beyond what it should be. So now we have to put this huge blanket on him to um, keep his body temperature up. And Oh, okay, now we figured out that um, heparin, which was what he was given in the stand-up ER um, to keep blood clots from forming, he was heparin resistant for three days and we had no idea. They had no idea, so oh, now he has another doctor. So there was nothing, nothing was typical. It was like, uh, I couldn't rest because at any point anything could happen. Hope looked like me reaching out to people. So I just reached out to um, Michelle, who was my saving grace pretty much through it all, um, and my girls at church. Um, 
Erica and Bianca and Kara and Sierra and it was just constant like I need some verses can you give me because I would just stare at my Bible and be and just I don't even know where to open it where in the Bible does it like I don't know <laughs> so I just need to turn to a page I needed to just speak to me so one of the most encouraging moments I had was when Steve had showed up um, and he he said, why don't you come and sit in the waiting room, waiting room with me and take a break. So I went and I sat in the waiting room with him and there was a waiting room full of people. But we talked about, I don't think we talked about anything at the hospital at that time, but we talked about Alex and we talked about Michelle and we talked about marriage and our children and life and it was it was like we had just a normal conversation and it was just the first glimpse of normalcy that I had felt that whole time and it gave me hope that that that's what I wanted that I wanted and that's what I needed to pray for was that just some normal whatever that looked like for our family again all of a sudden they were using more medications um, and they were more hopeful um, as far as we think we can take the ventilator out. We, can, we think we can do it now. We think that he has what he needs to take the ventilator out and it be successful. So at that point, it was January 7th. So it had at least been a week, maybe a week and a half before that point. Uh, yeah, it was really scary waking up um, knowing that I went to sleep on January 7th, and the first day I remember seeing was January 21st. So that's quite a long time to be under. Um, and then I got to looking at her, her notes in her phone, and then everything just got really scary. Just knowing everything that happened from the day I went down to the day now, and that was a really, really scary experience. But once I was awake, um, it, it seemed like it took like forever, um, but it was really only like just a few days. Um, but once I was up, they were able to get me awake and um, we started doing physical therapy. Um, and then once I knew that physical therapy was what was gonna get me home, I was just pushing it so hard. I just wanted to get up, I wanted to get out of my bed, I wanted to see my kids. Um, so it was, it was a slow journey, it was a roller coaster. Some days were good, some days were really bad. But just the, the fact that I was alive was really just enough to kind of just push me through it. Where once we got to the rehab unit, that's where my hope really, really turned in. Um, once I, once I was realizing like the support that she had through it all, the support that I had through it all, um, it was, it was amazing. And then once I got up there, and the doctors told me I was going to be able to see my kids. It was, that was the greatest hug I've ever had in my life because I didn't know about it. Ever. It's the only part that gets me. How many days was it waking up and getting to see your kids? Seventeen days. And just to know that my dad died of a heart attack when I was nine. I have a nine-year-old son. It was uh, it was the best hug I've ever had in my life. To, to have them come up and see me, and for me to be alive, and for the doctors to say I'm going home, and you know I got better. It was uh, that was the best part of the whole entire stay right there. That made me feel like a father again. Like like I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave my family again and. Just to have them there, my kids love me, man. And just to have them there, just loving on me and cracking jokes about me, but it was a, that was where everything turned for me. And I started to see all the goodness that was coming from it. Yeah, amen. You said you have a shout out, yeah? Yeah, so before we get started, I have a really special person here today, um, and she may get called to go help somebody else um, live and be with their family. So Susan, if you don't mind standing up for me. This is my Med um, patient rep. And, yeah. We call her um, A1 Day One because she was with us um, day one until the end. So she got to see him lifeless and now she's here with us today, so we are so, so thankful for her. <laughs> Thanks, because he's still alive. You yeah, know? thank you. <laughs> Amen, yeah. Um, it's crazy. We were uh, filming that, and we were talking, and 
they were saying how they're talking about like unpacking it with their kids and all that. And uh, he was just saying like he basically he said something along the lines of um, you tell your kids about Lazarus, but it's different when Lazarus is your dad. And it's like man. So praise God you're alive. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. Obviously. Yeah. You tell your um, kids these stories about Lazarus, and they're like okay, maybe, maybe that happened. But then they see it with their dad and they're like, okay, that happened. That yeah. can happen. Like God did that. He did. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Alex, what was your reaction um, to the amount of support you and Sam uh, received while you were dead? Uh, it was, it was overwhelming, man. Like just to see, we moved 1700 miles away from our home and, and found this church, but just the support, I mean, it felt like we were surrounded by our family and mm -hmm we've come to realize that this is the family God gave us for this reason. And it was, it was incredible just to see the support that she's had. You know, I prayed so long for her to have good, mm -hmm. strong relationships and to see that blossom here and to see her girls really pick her up and, and hold her firm. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Sam, what did you learn um, about God in this whole thing? What did you learn about his church? Mm. Lord. Um, <laughs> I was about to say, I learned a lot about God. I learned that... Um, there's a verse that has stuck with me, especially since becoming a mom, and it's be still and know. Um, and whenever my dad and I were in the waiting room at the, first, or at the second hospital, I just prayed, and I was like, God, I need your wisdom. I need your strength, because um, most of you know that I have anxiety, um, and there's no way that without God's strength and wisdom that I would have ever been able to get through this. There's, there's just no way. Um, so I learned that God, God was there even when I didn't think he was. And the strength and the wisdom of God is something, and the peace of God is something that does not make sense. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't, doesn't make yeah. sense. 100%. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, what about his church? Oh, man, his church. <sighs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> I think that's the most moving thing in that when people, people understand the love of God and they really know how to love, they, they take care of you in a way that you didn't even know you needed. Mm -hmm. That, Lord, what I, what I called Michelle after leaving the first stand up ER, I had no idea that, I didn't know that she was going to hit her knees in the middle of the Iglesia house and then somehow people in different countries were going to be praying mm -hmm. <laughs> and all across the world and man his church it, it just shows that God hears prayers that when you think that he's not yeah. listening that he does hear your prayers even if you're nothing's happening at the time and Lord there were a lot of people praying mm -hmm. there yeah. were a lot of people praying yeah <laughs> yeah um, yeah. Uh, so Sam, you journaled and took notes throughout the entire Ordelia. Mm -hmm. Alex, what you, what was it like going through those notes in the journals after the fact? Um, it, it just kind of made everything a reality for me. Uh, once I woke up, I was told I had a heart attack. Then I saw that I was asleep for 14 days. Mm -hmm. Um, so she just handed me her phone and I was looking, you know, the seizures, coding, having to be brought back to life, just everything through it. It was great for me to be able to process it and just really take it in day by day, but it was super helpful as well. So knowing what happened and not having to have her relive it and tell it to me every yeah. single day, yeah. it was really nice to just have that. What was like the most like shocking thing you read in the notes? Um, that my heart stopped six times. Yeah. I think that was what got me the most, um, just how close I was to not yeah. being a husband to her and a father to my kids again. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are so many things in the notes too that like I had, had to keep track of just to keep my head straight that there were seizures and then they weren't seizures they were myoclonus which means that there was the neuro doctors said there were dead parts of the brain mm -hmm. and then there were just x y and z so in turn at first when I started taking the notes I wasn't doing it so I could hand him the phone and say here's what and it was so I could keep myself straight that like, what's the goal for today? What, what are we trying to make it through today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, looking back, do you guys see like a through line of God at work, like before, during? Yeah, no, I, I definitely see, I mean, just us moving to Florida, 
I mean, that was God's <laughs> moving, and we moved 1,700 miles away from everything we know. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving from Tampa to St. Pete, I mean, that was another yeah. thing that God was doing. I was six minutes away from the ER that I needed, surrounded by the best doctors and the best care team I could possibly have. Mm -hmm. So he w he's, man, he's been moving since, since day one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was preparing us and setting us yeah. up and giving us what we needed to take, yeah. take this on. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't, I felt like, like, God, why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you doing something faster that everything's yeah. taking so long? But, like, when I look back, like, Alex drove himself to the hospital. Like, like what? Yeah. He drove himself to the hospital, finding out that he had coded six times. When he had the ventilator in at the first hospital, with the ventilator, he was still only statting at 60%. Um, that all of these bad things were just happening. And I thought, like, why is God now? Why, why were you not doing something faster? But, oh my gosh, like, he was working. It just, on his time. I just needed to learn how to trust his timing because yeah. yes. this is more than I could have ever imagined. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> um, Alex, uh, I did not have this question prep, but it came to my <laughs> mind. Um, you said, really, it was really funny. You said back there uh, that whenever you meet people, you now you start telling them, telling them about Jesus. And you say, you don't have to ask, nothing, you just go and tell them. Like, what, like, now you're on, like, fire for the Lord. Obviously, you loved the Lord before, but now you're like, you'll kill somebody for the Lord. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, like, like it, what's that like? Explain it. Uh, it's just, I know who I was. God knows who I was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, this is not the first time that he saved me. He saved me with mm -hmm. salvation, yeah. you know, six years ago. And, mm -hmm. and then for him to do this, and it's... Being so close to death and having people that you love who don't know the Lord, or yeah. encountering people who don't know the Lord, mm -hmm. we don't have any time. Uh, to me, we don't have time. We don't have 15 minutes. We don't have, we don't have to the next day or, or to the next week. Yes. I mean, this life can literally end in a, in a blink of an eye. I mm -hmm. walked into a hospital and then I died in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's really just like what's in my head so much. Anytime mm -hmm. I encounter anyone or any, I, I find somebody who's struggling in their faith, it's just, you just put your trust in him, love him, and, and believe that he came and he is who he says he is. Yeah. And I mean, what does this world have for me? Mm. And, yeah, amen. And amen. not to like selfishly say, but I typically wouldn't be up on a stage talking to all of you in this sort of setting. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love all of you. And I think that this was so eye-opening to me that yeah. anything can happen, not yeah. to scare you, but to scare you that you don't know when your time is and you need to make sure that you are right with the Lord and that you know who the Lord is and that the Lord also knows who you are and you have that relationship yeah. because I, and that's the thing I think I was the most thankful for in the moment with Alex is that his relationship with the Lord had changed over six years and that, you know, the alternative is something I couldn't wrap my brain around, but I knew where he was going. Yeah. And so there was that hope. But do you guys know where you're going? Like, do you know where your husband or your family are going? Yes, we are accountable for ourselves, but do you know where you're going? Yeah. Amen. Thanks, Sam. Sorry. <laughs> Give me some. No, it's great. Um, love it. And then lastly, how has this whole thing, like, galvanized your faith? In what ways do you see the Lord, like, still moving? Um, I'm on stage. <laughs> 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 um, do you want to? Yeah, so just say yes. I thought it was kind of funny, like, waking mm -hmm. up in the hospital and talking to her and talking to my family back home and, you know, just telling them I'm alive and now I'm just waiting for what the Lord has for me. And then we come back to church and it's say yes. So we have really took that on to the fullest extent this year. Any opportunity we have just to be a little light to somebody, mm -hmm. we're taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing where we can. We're getting plugged in where the church needs us and where the community needs us. And yeah. mm -hmm. we're going to just be that light while we're here. Well, it's crazy. When he first got out of the hospital, he kept saying, like, what do I do with all of this grace and all of this love? Mm -hmm. And then we come in and Steve is like, is, talk, is speaking about how... Um, God just wants us to worship him yeah. and to love him. And I thought, like, man, how, how amazing is our God mm -hmm. that he saved my husband yeah. twice, and he just wants me to come and worship him? Yeah. Like, okay. Like, yeah. you, and, you know, then I said, anything you want, Lord, I will do. And then they said, get up on stage and speak to the church. And I thought, <laughs> okay. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see. But I'm telling you, 
don't let the Lord humble you because he will. Like on January 7th, our marriage was not doing bad. Our family was not doing bad. Like we were in a good spot. But man, man, did he really show us. Did he really show us who he was and did he strengthen our marriage and our, our family and our relationship? And he really, I will, I will never complain about my husband's boots being in the middle of the living room floor again. <laughs> I, I kept just praying for him to wake up and argue with me. That's all I wanted. I was like, please show me, show me that passion. Show me that you can move your body and show me that you can do those things. Because man, whenever it gets almost taken from you, all kinds, I didn't know when he walked out of the door that day, I couldn't remember if I told him I loved him. And that kept playing over and over and over in my head. So sorry, I was getting a little emotional there, but. Yeah, you're good. Well, thank you. Can you guys say thank you to them for sharing? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, let me pray over us, over you guys, um, and then we'll keep moving on. So let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you uh, for the things that you've done, the things that you're doing. Um, I thank you for Alex. I thank you for Sam. I thank you for their faith in you. Um, Lord, gosh, I can't, I can't imagine, but it proves. Like it, it, they, um, they you know, put their money where their mouths were, you know, and they... Lord, they didn't shy away from you. They didn't pull away from you. They didn't lean away from you. They leaned into you. And in that, Lord, you blessed them. So we thank you. Um, we thank you um, for your son's resurrection. And that because of your son's resurrection, um, Alex, this whole ordeal is worth something, and it's not wasted, Lord. So as uh, Alex continues to share his story about how you saved him for the second time, Lord, will you, um, will you bless it? Um, and above all else, Lord, will you, will you be glorified in it? Not Alex, not Sam, not, not the doctors, nurses, nobody, but Lord, just you. Um, so again, we love you. Uh, we pray these things in your name through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 If I was God, none of that would have happened. If I was God, none of you would be dealing with the aftermath of a hurricane. If I was sovereign, none of you would be sick. None of you would be dealing with financial issues. None of you would be dealing with relational hardship. If I was God, everything would just be smooth sailing. Alex and Sam would have never gone through that. Alex would have gone and played flag football, had a ball, come home smelling terrible, got in the shower and boasted. Even if he didn't play well, he would have just had an amazing memory in time. None of that would have happened. But what do you do when nothing makes sense? What do you do? How do you respond? How do you react, real people? Any real people come to church? How do you respond when the wires don't connect? When it doesn't somehow make any kind of, of reasoning, that, that, that somehow that thing in you that is trying to comprehend and struggle and wrestles and tugs just doesn't connect. Am I alone in that? Have, have, does anybody else ask those questions? That's a young family man. That's three kids and a young wife and a, a future and a, a, that's so far ahead of him. And, and he died. Time six. What do you do when, when things seem senseless and, and unreasonable? If you've ever wrestled with that, if you've ever struggled with that, maybe it'll be a warm blanket for you, but 2,000 years ago, people wrestled with that too. Matter of fact, 2,000 years ago, Luke said that there were thousands of people that were following Jesus. We read that in, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. And at one point, they said, boy, this is the guy to ask the question to. Why does bad stuff happen to good people? If anybody's going to know, Jesus will know. 
We've seen him heal people. We've seen him absolutely just debate and totally smash the religious and the legal leaders. This is the guy to ask, what do you do? How do you respond when things seem absolutely senseless? It's recorded in Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5, and I'm just going to read it for you. It says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Perish. Now, now, when we just read that in a cursory way, it, it seems like, Jesus, aren't you being a little insensitive there? I mean, these were real news stories. Some of you are news junkies like I am. The older I get, the more I'm in touch with, with community and national and international news. I'm just interested in that. The older you get, too, the more you're interested also in war documentaries. I don't know where that came from, but you just get more interested in these things. And and whether you're a news junkie like I am or not, they had news junkies back then. And, and they came up to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, did you hear the breaking news? There were some Galileans. You're from Galilee, Jesus. And, and they went to be obedient, law-abiding Jews. They went down to Jerusalem. They bought their sacrifices. They went in the temple. And Governor Pilate had them killed. Their blood mixed with the animal sacrifices. And Jesus, right away, knows what they're trying to zero in on. Did somehow they deserve that? Did somehow, was God mad at them? And Jesus says, no. And immediately, he takes his eyes off of them, off of it, off of the, the breaking news, and he puts it on them, and he says, man, unless you repent, unless you repent, you're all going to perish too. And then Jesus said, oh, oh, clearly you guys are interested in news. Have you heard this one? How about those 18 folks? Sweet, innocent, good people. And they're in Jerusalem one day, and they're walking under the Tower of Siloam, and that whole monstrous edifice fell on top of them and crushed them, wiped them out. Do you think they were worse sinners? Because something bad happened to some good people? I tell you, No. Unless you repent, you all will perish as well. Now, it's important that we get here. Jesus wasn't minimizing or dismissing the sorrow, real sorrow, of those events. When bad things happen to good people, when senseless things happen, we need to remember a couple of things. First of all, that God cares and comforts us, even in the seemingly senseless and secondly, that God never leaves us in the seemingly senseless. You know, that's the best way to find out who's with you, who's for you, who's a friend, who's really somebody who's going to stick with you is when tragedy comes. Who's with me? Who's for me? Who's only with me in word? Who's the, the real kind? Who's the tenacious friend? Who's the one who's not just a good time Charlie, but when things really get rough, and when something comes in out of the blue, man, I know I can count on them. Do you have people like that in your life? In all of this, it's important. In all the bad stuff that happens in the world, is that we need to remember that, that God cares, he comforts, and he never leaves us, no matter how rough and senseless things get. Now, there might be somebody here today, or maybe somebody watching online today, and you're saying, Steve, that's all nice and all, but... That God is loving, that God is reliable, but, but why? Why this? Why them? Why now? Why my house? I, I don't, where, where do I even start? The, the water was two feet high in my house. I'm standing in the ground zero of my own house. Where do I even start? Why? I once heard a conference speaker say that we, as human beings, are meaning machines. Of all of God's creations, we want to know the whys. 
All the other creatures, they just kind of go on. They kind of deal with things. They're extremely resistant. But we are not satisfied until things make sense, till the wires connect, till the variables all just kind of line up. Let me just throw things out in the atmosphere. And some of these things may land in good soil, and some of you may say, I don't buy it, Steve. Here's some things. I'm just throwing it out there. We need to remember when senseless things are hard to to understand is that we live in a fallen and a chaotic world. This is not the world God created in Genesis 1 and 2. This This is a fractured, broken, fallen, decaying, rotting ripoff of what God created originally. And guess what? We get to live in it. We get to live in a place where it's chaotic and it is fallen, and where a lot of bad stuff happens to some good people just like you. Good people who, after a big hurricane, came to church at the 1030 today with pure hearts, people who want some understanding out there. We live in a fallen and chaotic world. Second of all is that God sees a bigger design and picture. God sees what you don't. All we see is brokenness. All we see is fallenness. All we see is confusion and chaos. But we believe that God transcends all that, and he sees a plan and a picture that you and I don't get to see, at least not this side of heaven. And that's why faith is so important. Because as we go through the different ebbs and flows and the twists and the turns and the stuff we like and a whole lot of stuff we don't, That's where the the muscle of of faith has to be developed and and flexed. As though it's dark, God, I'm still holding your hand. I'm still trusting you. I'm believing in your character. Thirdly, again, just throwing this out there, is that God's thinking and ways are not like ours. Jesus said through Isaiah, the great prophet, in Isaiah 55 and 8, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Doesn't it disappoint us when God doesn't think the way we think and do what we want him to do? But God is God, and we're not. God is on a totally different line. God is in a different stratospherically higher plateau in understanding. God sees a picture we don't see. And in the middle of all of that, His ways does not compute with us. Man, I wish God thought more like me. Oh, he's thinking of you, but he's not thinking like you. God's ways are not our ways. Again, if I was the CEO of the universe, Alex, you'd have never gone through that. Sam, you would have never had to go through that. That, Never. But God's thoughts and his ways, frankly, are are not ours. In our text today, Jesus' response, it it, it can almost be interpreted as cruel and dismissive. But I believe what he was calling those people then, and what I believe he's calling us today, is is simply a few things. First of all, uh, delete who's good and bad. The Bible makes no distinctions like that. Well, it makes sense in my thinking, and I'm assuming in many of yours, that God protects good people, and only the bad people ought to suffer. Real people, are you still with me right now? Does, is that not how we think? Is that how not natural man thinks? I, I mean, that, that, that's... Uh, but the Bible makes no distinction of, of good and bad, undeserving and deserving. You know what the Bible does tell us in Romans 6.23? Scripture makes it clear what we all deserve. Death. What? I I came to church the Sunday after a hurricane. I deserve all of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I are born incompatible with the holy God. As awesome as you are, not one of you runs to God in every situation. We hide from God. We want to be God. We want to control the universe and everybody in it. And because all the way back to the fall, All of us have been broken. Adam and Eve took a fall, and guess what? We've been tumbling down ever after. 
The truth of the matter, guys, is that there are no distinctions, good and bad. Well, well, Steve, that's not fair. What a gross argument. Some of you should be past that whole fair thing. Is it fair, really, that the Son of God should somehow inhabit the world that he created and be blasphemed, tortured, spat upon, and brutalized? Is that fair? Let's get past fair. Life isn't fair. But today we celebrate and we cry and we raise hands and worship. Why? Because it wasn't fair. That our good Friday was his horrible Friday. And so we need to delete who's good and who's bad. Somebody came to Jesus one time and said, look, good teacher. And Jesus just stopped him right there. TV timeout. Ain't nobody good but God. We can have the fruit of goodness, Galatians 5, but none of us are intrinsically, self-emanatingly good. I believe, secondly, we need to live daily recognizing the brevity and the uncertainty of life. Sam, I'm piggybacking your preaching this morning. Life is uncertain. Life is uncertain. And so we need to what? Be ready. We need to be ready. Steve, praise the Lord. I've got that box with a big old check in it. Good for you. Give all the glory to God for that. Here's my follow-up question. Here's question B. Are you getting other people ready? You getting other people ready? No, man, I got the winning lottery ticket. I'm ready to go to Tallahassee and cash it in. Listen, God wants everybody to go to Tallahassee. And it's important that we get people around us ready. That's why God's got a church. God's got a people here at New Beginnings is we need to live daily, recognizing that life is uncertain. Second of all, see the bigger picture, eternity. Man, we're just passing through this place. We're foreigners. We don't belong here. How many of you know the older you get and the more you're walking with Jesus Christ, you recognize, I don't, I don't belong here. There's something in me that tells me. I don't know what it is. You know what it is? Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in our hearts. There's some stuff you know, and you have no understanding why you know what you know. And the reason is because God has put it there. And we know this, this can't be it. There's got to be a bigger picture. There's an eternity. There's a hell to gain. There's a hell to, a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. Second and fourth of all, I think that we need to focus on God's mercy. When bad stuff happens and we're trying to somehow wrap our cranium around it, it's so easy to say, oh man, God is just so, so hell-bent on punishment and destruction. The God of wrath. And he is. God is a God of justice just as much as he's a God of love. But we need to recognize even in all the bad stuff and the unexpected stuff, that God ultimately is a God of restoration and hope. How do I know that? The cross of Jesus Christ. It's what he offers to every man, woman, and child. But here's the the fifth thing. And here's the thing Jesus said, not just once, but twice in our text today. Repent. Repent. It's a big word. It's a religious word. It's Old Testament new. It's all over the place. It's a common thread throughout all of Scripture. Repentance is more than just feeling bad about it. We should feel bad when we jump the fence that says no trespassing. You know, for so many years, all those thou shalt nots that are in the Bible, I thought, man, God is just like a celestial killjoy, man. Doesn't he want us to have any fun out there? And then the older I got, I looked at all of those commandments and all those thou shalt nots, and I recognized that that is a loving parent say, do not reach up and touch that hot burner because it's going to hurt. And despite all of his warnings and his warnings and love, and guess what? How many of you, real people with me, we reached up anyway and recognized that indeed is a very hot burner. He loves us so much. And God tells us, man, it's, it's not enough just to feel bad, but, but repentance is to turn your life urgently and completely toward God. Urgently and completely toward God. And that's not just a one and done. That is an every day. Every day, policing my life, policing my behavior, policing my thought life, and doing a course direction 
I need to go towards God. I'm going towards myself. I'm going towards this sin. I'm going towards this appetite. I'm going towards this nasty habit that I have. I'm going towards this bias. I'm going towards this bigotry. I'm going to, I need to get my life back on course. I need to urgently, deliberately, and intentionally go back towards God. That's repentance. That's what it means to repent. It's an everyday thing. So why do bad things happen to good people? Guys, that question is so old school. That question has been floating around since unfaithful brother Cain killed faithful brother Abel. Why is a good guy, a faithful kid like Abel, why did he die such a gruesome death at the hand of his brother? How do you make any sense of that. Bottom line, bottom line is that you may never have your why completely satisfied this side of heaven. The Gales had a little foretaste today. We had to go through that to have another testimony that has the potential to inspire people from one side of this sanctuary to the other. They, and that was a grace. That was a gift. We talked about grace being the gift last week. You got to see that this side of heaven. But God was under no obligation to tell you why. There are some of you who are wrestling with whys. Why isn't this person here? Why did that happen to me? You're wrestling. You're trying to make sense of senselessness. And you're burning up so much energy. And there's no guarantees, friends. You're going to get that blank filled in. If you even get a piece of it, again, it's a grace. It's an undeserved gift. But here's the good news and here's the promise. Is someday. Say someday. Someday. You'll understand. 1 Corinthians 13 says, right now, you and I, we are, we are looking through some really smudged up glasses. <laughs> I have to have a pair of magnifiers everywhere I go. I can't even read a menu if I don't have these things. I hate that. I plant them everywhere. I just squirrel them everywhere in my life in case I need them. But the truth of the matter is, Right now, we're looking through glass darkly. We see things, but we don't see things. We see shadows, but we don't see clarification. But Paul says in that beautiful, often quoted chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he said, right now it's hard to see, but someday we will see. Someday we will know as we have been known. How are you known by God today? Gold star on the forehead, if you're thinking right now, absolutely, perfectly. And someday we'll be able to recognize why we had to go through that seemingly senseless stuff. Again, some of us are burning ulcers. Why, why, why? I get it. I'm a meaning machine too. But don't spend the day there. Don't spend the night there. There's some stuff we just may never know. But it's in those periods that we have to trust in the goodness of God. And with all the breaking bad stories, and boy, there's a ton of them, there's good news. Let me remind you that there is always good news. There's always a silver line. I was listening to our our admin specialist, Sarah, this morning. She was telling me about the devastation in our house. But she said, you know what? In the middle of all these bad, bad things, you know what? I was meaning to replace my washer and dryer and dishwasher and carpet and... and... God knows what he's doing, friends. God knows what he's doing. And faith, again, is not when everything comes up roses and you compute everything. But it's in the seemingly senseless. It's in your response. That's the evidence of your faith. Man, what was that like for people 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost? They recognized, my goodness, 
the best personality ever. The second member of the Trinity came to earth, and we killed him. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. God left the glory, splendor, and adulation of heavenly hosts, came to earth, died on a cross for my sins, and we killed him. What do we do? And Peter and the others stood up, now filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2.38 said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? That's still the instruction. Repent. Repent and be baptized. There's hope. There's hope. God is working a plan. God is moving history towards a redemptive conclusion. And Jesus perished that you might have life and you might have it eternally. And so my appeal to you as a brother who loves you, whether we know each other well or not today, is repent urgently, intentionally. Do whatever the heck you have to do to move your life intentionally towards the Lord. And watch it tomorrow because you're going to drift a little bit. Get it back on course and live this life of repentance. And for those of you who have not been baptized, we are standing ready to make that a beautiful memory in your life. Guys, this world is senseless through natural eyes. But through spiritual eyes... We have hope today. And I think that's what God wanted me to tell you. I love you guys. We don't have an invitation song today, but I am going to ask that, Melody, if you would come up, and Rick, if you would come up, and if you have, thank you, Rick, if you would have a a need of prayer today, I'm going to pray a dismissal prayer. This will be it. Go home, have lunch, go box. Um, But if you need prayer today, see my friends up here. Uh, If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, it's time. It's time. I I read Mark told me that. It's time. All right. There you go. Mark is preaching over here. The Holy Spirit is on Mark. Amen. Let me pray. This will be our dismissal prayer. If you'd stand with me. Again, we will stay here and pray with you as long as possible. Let's pray a prayer just of God's favor on many of you who are dealing with the devastation of this uh, this hurricane. Uh, Some of you are very worried about something already kind of developing out there. Uh, Hey, God is good. Amen? Amen. God is faithful. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Next Gen Sunday, Father, thank you for the young people of this church. Thank you, Father, for their devotion to you. Thank you, Lord, that they are recognizing at such a young age, Lord, that that Jesus is Lord. And we thank you, Father, for this ministry to our children, to our students, even in the nursery, Lord. And we thank you. And, Father, we've been blessed today by their participation. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had to worship you today. For, God, you alone are worthy of all of our worship. Father, we thank you for the powerful testimony that we've heard today. And, Father, we pray that, God, you would, long after this service, that you would continue to minister this testimony, this story, this real-life story to our spirits and remind us of the uncertainty and the brevity of life. And that, God, that we would respond appropriately to that. God, I pray and that we would just worship you for, for all that you've done in our life, but God, that we would also be ready and we'd be preparing other people around us. Father, for the many in our community, and yes, even many here in the church that are, are dealing with devastation, Father, we ask that you would give them hope today. Not some finger-crossing, I hope so hope, but Lord, real hope in your faithfulness. God, we pray that you would give them favor, Father, with whoever they need favor with. We pray that they would get the help that they need, tangible help, that, Father, that they would just hang on to their holy faith, and that, God, that this would result in an amazing testimony, another amazing testimony of your faithfulness in their lives. So, Father, you know our needs before we ask, and we ask, God, that you would meet those needs according to your will 
and Father, for your glory today. Father, we ask that you dismiss us, Father, with your, your, your sun shining in our hearts, and Father, that we would be good and faithful ambassadors today and throughout this week. Father, this is a time when many people just need a little bit of hope. And so, God, would you send us out with a smile, with a helping hand, and with words of real encouragement. Thank you for the time you gave us this morning. We love you, Lord. And we thank you, God, for the good things that you've done in us and through us for Jesus and his renown. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We love you.